Happy Friday, everyone. I am Nick Slavic. I am the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter. Uh, every Friday, usually at noon, sometimes in the morning, I hop on Facebook Live and I'm here to answer any of your questions. They can be painting, uh, inside, outside, uh, decorative finishing, wallpapering, furniture finishing, cabinets, which I get a lot on, uh, decks, uh, any miscellaneous sort of thing that has to do with restoration, painting, whatever, I'm here for you. So, um, <clears throat> the purpose of this and, and the reason I started Ask a Painter was uh, so that you can uh, chime in anytime you want during these live feeds. You can also chime in during the week, but especially during the live feeds, you will not interrupt me. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some cabinet finishing questions that I've recently had. Uh, you will not be interrupting me today if you start listing your questions uh, in the comment section there. So um, <clears throat> at the end of this live feed, uh, I will go through all those questions. They don't have to be related to cabinets. They can be absolutely anything. So I know you guys have some pressing questions. Uh, if it's a question about something you've done in the past, if it's something you're thinking about doing, if you want a pros uh, sort of you know, take on a certain project or color or design or whatever, that's what I'm here for, guys. So any questions you have, you let me know. But today, um, <clears throat> specifically, I'm going to focus on a few uh, cabinet questions today. Uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of these were kind of sparked on by the last big kitchen that I did here. Uh, people were seeing my process, and I sort of uh, did some posts in between to kind of show people what I do. Uh, and, and it spurred some questions about cabinets, both from pros and homeowners. So I'm going to go over a few of those today with you guys. Uh, Tamara Jackson uh, is somebody that wrote in and uh, asked me a, a question about a vanity in a cabinet that she painted. Now, uh, about 10 minutes ago on my Facebook feed, I posted a, um, a, a little grouping of pictures uh, that I'm going to be referring to. There's a, there's a blue painted vanity, which I'll, I'll talk about. That's Tamara Jackson's. Uh, there is uh, uh, a decorative corbel that was uh, stripped on there. Uh, so if, if you guys want to look through before, during, after, I have a post with a bunch of reference pictures that I'll be uh, talking about during this live feed. There's a blue cabinet on there that I will talk about now. The gist of it is that uh, Tamara, she painted her uh, bathroom vanity and felt a little bit iffy afterwards. It kind of felt soft, kind of felt like you could, uh, you know, maybe scratch it off if you really wanted to. Um, depending on the process, and she kind of, uh, you know, laid out her process for me, uh, things like that. Um, if you're feeling iffy about something you just painted, especially woodwork, cabinets, things like that, number one, keep in mind that most people will say, uh, most paint scientists will say, it takes about two weeks uh, to cure uh, to its, its basic full hardness. Um, you know, we're at, at two weeks, we're probably give maybe 80, 90% uh, full cure. And uh, some people even say it takes 30 full days for a water-based paint to cure. Now, oils, traditional oils, pure oils, in my opinion, cure a little bit faster than that. Uh, but uh, if, if you painted something and you know you've, you did it the right way, give it some time. Give it a couple weeks. Uh, and also, uh, I get a lot of questions, too, where um, <coughs> I have... Uh, I try not to poo-poo a lot of products, a lot of uh, processes, uh, things that other people do, but I get a lot of questions about chalk paint. Chalk paint is, uh, is chalk. Uh, it is not a protective coating, it is a decorative coating. So uh, when you apply chalk paint, it touts itself as kind of the wonder paint, and, it, and it's the paint that, if it was true, would cure just about every problem that us pros have. It says it's self-priming, it says it, uh, it's easily sanded, it says it's, uh, it's decorative, uh, it doesn't need to be protected. All those things are false, well, except for the decorative part. It does look really cool, but it is not self-priming. There is no product that is self-priming. Some things stick to others just by their chemical nature. Chalk paint is not one of them. Uh, especially when you're doing cabinets, when you're doing woodwork, things like that, furniture, for the love of God, clean and prime those things. You will, you will be very thankful that you went through the process of doing that. And keep in mind, a kitchen, uh, this kitchen didn't quite take us that long, but a normal kitchen uh, will take me 40 hours of prep time. That's uh, me and my somewhere between you know two and five apprentices, depending on the size of the crew at the time, uh, 40 hours. So uh, if, uh, and that's us, we have trucks full of the uh, specific gear. Uh, I have 20 years of experience and my crew is highly trained and highly motivated. So when you're going to paint your kitchen cabinets, when you're going to paint some trim, when you're gonna do a piece of furniture, keep in mind that it takes me 40 hours uh, of prep to get this up to the place where I start applying primer to it. So don't, 
don't don't get discouraged in one of these projects there is no more technically difficult project than painting your kitchen cabinets or trim inside a house that's currently being lived in so uh, Tamara was saying that uh, she felt a little bit iffy about her blue cabinet um, number one uh, she sent me her process she sent me her paints um, the biggest mistake uh, I think that occurred was uh, I believe she did a good enough prep but there was no primer in the process um, she used a very good paint for it but um, nowadays you know when everything is touted as self priming and this and that um, I can't blame homeowners for going right to that because if you watch any DIY or HGTV show they get out that little tiny roller and the first thing they do without even taking a cabinet door off they dip it into that gallon of paint and they just start going at that cabinet door right in the middle. No, no thoughts as to sanding, cleaning, prep, disassembly, labeling, numbering, uh, you know, looking for defects, getting off cooking grease, things like that. And especially when you get into bathrooms, when there could be a lot of moisture in the air. Moisture over time, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a case of a house that's, you know, somewhere between 20 and 50 years old, uh, just repeated, repeated uh, contact with moisture will lessen a finish. So, you know, dipping into a can of uh, primer and paint in one or self-priming paint and going right to a cabinet is about the easiest way to ruin a cabinet. So, um, what could have been done to prevent this, uh, well, maybe we should take it from what to do now. Um, if you wait two to four weeks, that paint will be at its full hardness. Um, hopefully, it will wear well. Uh, if you can get away, Tamara, without uh, uh, abrading it a lot, uh, coming into contact with it a lot, normally as these finishes age, and I've seen a lot of um, sort of do-it-yourself stuff, uh, it actually is not that bad. You're going to get some chips. There's always the two doors right under the vanity uh, where your uh, legs come in contact, knees come in contact. You open it up, you throw something away, it uh, gets a little moisture on it. You're going to get nicks, you're going to get chips. And I, and I would never lie to you and say that my finish will never nick and never chip either. Uh, if you think about this process, the wood cabinet doors are a semi-soft structure, you know, depending on what they're made out of. Uh, if you run into it with a metal pan, a sharp edge or something, the paint is the weak link between there. Even though the wood is soft, most oak is harder than a paint finish, even the very, very uh, most high quality paint finish. So there are there is so much a paint can do if you hit it with something sharp if you hit it with the edge of a, a sharp baking sheet or something like that you will always chip a painted finish even over bare wood brand new cabinets so number one don't get disturbed discouraged if you start getting a little chipping a little bit of wear the good thing is the paint you use is very very easy to touch up just make sure that it's not coming into a contact with a lot of water uh, things like that uh, another question i get all the time is I did a dining room table, I got out the primer and paint in one, I, I put it on there. Um, is there anything I can do now to protect it? Yes, there is a harder coating you can put over the top, but you're always going to have that you know, table, primer and paint in one. This is going to be your weak link for time and eternal unless you strip it all off. Now, you could put a polyurethane or an oil varnish over the top, but <laughs> again, if you run something into it, there's always going to be this squishy, kind of soft, uncured... Um, layer underneath so you can only have uh, uh, results that are so good at that point now there is one piece of furniture uh, in my house and I think we actually sold it a couple years ago uh, that had a water-based sort of wall paint applied to it uh, I distressed the whole thing because uh, I had to sand the, the, the paint anyway uh, but I was gonna leave it intact because it was a piece of furniture that that uh, it was not an antique uh, it didn't require a full stripping and restoration but i thought it was worth saving i did a whole bunch of scratch tests over it and surprisingly you know the the water-based wall paint that somebody used on it stuck fairly well so i distressed it made it look kind of antiquey i glazed it i distressed it i did all this other stuff i put an oil polyurethane over the top and it weared really really well so i did that knowing that there's always the chance that this water-based wall paint uh, is going to be the weak link in it and expect some chips but surprisingly this this fared fairly well because that original layer of paint stuck very, very well to that. Now, if you have a whole bunch of uh, uh, cooking, uh, cooking oils, uh, you know, a splatter from the stove on it, if you have a whole bunch of, you know, toothpaste stuff and, and moisture marks from a bathroom, you know, the paint's only going to stick so good. So, um, you can try, uh, you can try to put um, some oil-based polyurethane over it, but I would certainly wait months. I would, I wouldn't even do the two to two to four weeks. I would say give it months and see how it wears. If you're finding that you're not getting a lot of chipping, leave it be, touch it up every once in a while if you need to, but otherwise, uh, six months from now, something, scuff it again, 
uh, and just maybe put a couple coats of oil oil varnish on it if you're concerned with it. So I've seen good, I've seen bad. Um, I've also seen woodwork where you can walk up and use the pad of your finger and white paint off of too. So it, it largely has to do with what was on the wood originally, how you did it, how you prepped it, things like that. Uh, so uh, Tamara, I hope that helps. Uh, I will be sending you one of my handmade mugs for that. Uh, and let us know how that wears. Uh, it, you used a very good paint on it, so my hopes is that the, the paint will do what it should and at least give you a high enough quality where you can live with that. You didn't do anything wrong. Uh, if you go to a big box store, you're going to get a pimply face kid in there who's never painted in their life, and they're going to tell you, oh yeah, this is a primer paint one, you go right over. I don't blame anybody for doing that. Uh, it's all a learning curve, and especially when you're staring down the barrel of 40 hours of prep, I can completely understand why somebody would look for a time saver like a primer and paint in one. So, hope that helps. Um, <clears throat> another cabinet question, uh, Todd Hill, a pro uh, who I follow, uh, sent in a question. Uh, what do you do to remove years of grease uh, and cooking fumes on cabinets? Uh, I ran into this on a set of cabinets and uh, had to clean them numerous times before the primer would stop separating when I applied it. Um, very common thing, and uh, I'll tell you exactly what me and my apprentices did this morning. Uh, yesterday we disassembled this kitchen uh, during a half day. We had a little extra time. This morning we showed up. We grabbed every cabinet door, drawer, cutting board, this and that. We brought it to my shop. Uh, the first thing that we do is, uh, is patch all the old holes. Now, if you can see, there's some putty marks uh, on these cabinets here like this. And I also included some up-close pictures of this in that uh, Facebook post that I put on. Um, these were the old-style uh, uh, applied hinges like this where they have the two screws on and then attached to the back of the doors. The homeowners, uh, very wisely, uh, got rid of those and updated them with... Uh, uh, hidden hinges and these are very slick now they're it's a ton of hardware and they're, and they're fairly expensive but uh, they had them all retrofit and these are really slick because then you don't see anything from the outside uh, it's basically just you know the the door attaches there and and you don't see anything so now but because they did this now there's holes everywhere where the hinges used to be and not only holes the the two screw holes when people apply those hinges they press that metal, uh, that stamp metal, into the actual oak. So you get these divots and you get these dents of the outlines of the hinges. So when you do something like this, my process is to uh, sand the areas where I'm going to patch because you want that patch to adhere. Uh, I sand it down, uh, sometimes to bare wood, sometimes to not, depending on the finish, just to get it smooth. Uh, whenever you put screws into wood, it almost backs some wood out of the hole and almost makes kind of like a little crater, a raised crater. So you want to sand that down so it's nice and smooth. Uh, and then I use a, a water-based wood filler. And for anybody who knows me, I do a lot of experimenting with stuff. I always want to find something, uh, especially when we talk about wood fillers, that dries fast, that's super hard, that's sandable, and is stable. Um, uh, there's a lot of, I, I, Bondo is, is a great thing. Uh, Bondo is one of the hardest fillers you can get, but it is a bear to sand, and it is miserable. And uh, even with random orbital sanders, sometimes Bondo is just a pain to sand. Um, there's rock hard water putty. I found that to not stick to a lot of things. Uh, so I found uh, this great uh, water based wood filler from Ace Hardware. It's very cheap, it's very plentiful. Uh, it goes on very easy, it's stable, it doesn't separate like an oil based filler. And, and again, for those of you who know me, I'm always a fan of oil based stuff, and I have not found an oil based filler uh, to do this. It sticks to everything like glue, it sands very easy, and you, you know, like a lot of cheap fillers, things that sand, I mean, there's a reason I don't use drywall mud to do this because you can just put your fingernail right into it. This stuff is rock hard. You cannot etch it, you cannot scratch it with your finger, but yet it sands pretty easily. So I think it's a great product for that sort of thing. So I apply my water-based wood filler, uh, I give it overnight, and then I come back and sand it. And I showed a picture of kind of how I sand it. And you want to leave um, the slightest amount of haze in there. You want it to fill. Uh, if you sand it too much, you're gonna have to start this whole process over. So you want a, a slight little haze there uh, and when you sand it, you want the flattest random orbital pad you have, the flattest hand sander. If you take kind of a ball of uh, sandpaper and use your finger, the, the, it's going to contour to your finger, and you're actually going to you know, sand a divot into it. So you really want to have something flat, even a block of wood with sanding paper over the top to sand it flat. And that will make sure that you're not digging the filler out of those. So, so what I did, uh, even on the back of the cabinet doors, I filled in all the old holes. My prep process for this, and, and this goes to Todd as, as, uh, as well as it does for uh, Tamara too, that first uh, I address the filler areas. Uh, we have a three-person kind of a conveyor belt of, of production in my shop where 
I take the first cabinet, I set it on one of my high padded benches to not hurt the cabinet doors. I have a, a mouse sander, a random orbital sander, a shop vac, all that good stuff standing by. And I start sanding the back with all the filler on it to make sure that gets smooth. I then sand the finish, abrade all the edges, flip it over, abrade the edges again. I hand it off to the next apprentice. Uh, and he takes a hand sander, a sanding pad. I don't have one right here, but it's a, it's a medium grit sanding pad and he gets all the contours, uh, sands all the little edges that a mouse sander or a random orbital sander can't get. He then hands it to the next apprentice who takes a brush and a shop vac, shop vacs it off, and then we tack rag it down with water to get the rest of the dust off. We stack them in an area of the shop so they can all dry standing up. Once we've gone through all the cabinet doors, the drawers, the uh, 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 cutting boards, things like that, then we do our final inspection and wipe down. Uh, on the back of every cabinet door and drawer, there's usually those either clear little bumpers or those brown felt bumpers. And when you peel those off, they usually leave some adhesive residue behind. Um, to get that off, I use alcohol and uh, a certain kind of rag, microfiber, microfiber towels. Um, I use denatured alcohol, and, and we're all in safety gear from sanding anyway, so the alcohol won't affect. We got our respirators, things like that. You take one of those um, uh, rags, you soak it in alcohol and you do the final wipe down. That'll remove any little micro dust on there uh, and it actually prepares old finishes very, very well for adhesion. Uh, I used to use mineral spirits. I used to just use water. I used to use lacquer thinner. I used to use all that kind of stuff. All that stuff is real kind of volatile and this and that. Denatured alcohol, the finish feels accepting after you're done. And for anybody who's done any amount of woodwork prep, you understand what a good accepting piece of wood. It, it has a tooth to it. When you run your finger across, it's smooth, but it also, it makes sense in your mind that something would have something just to dig in. You know, when you put a primer or a paint on there, uh, it feels like something would just be able to grab it and hold it. So our final wipe down is with denatured alcohol and these microfiber rags. I actually have one. We use these and uh, my wife's nice enough to donate all of her old ones to us. And then they sell them in, you know, six packs at the hardware store for a couple bucks. And these things are the best tack rags you will ever get. So uh, they, they hold a ton of dust. Um, and after our final wipe down with alcohol, then we start the priming process. I have two spraying stations in my shop and my apprentices sort of feed me cabinet doors and then we have drying racks on the wall. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm spraying and uh, the crew is stacking them and letting them dry and we pump up the heat in the uh, cabinet in the, in the finishing shop uh, to 75 and we bake those cabinets. Uh, and this is all within the specs. And normally when they test out the drying times of, of most paints, a lot of them tested actually at 77 degrees, which uh, you know simulates the outdoor stuff good, but it doesn't come near to simulate people's houses. So that's how we do it. This, uh, uh, long ago uh, in, in an Ask a Painter uh, way back into the uh, past, I showed you guys uh, that I am a huge fan of, of scratch test and crosshatch testing. It's, it's two ways that I make sure, you know, when somebody has me into their house to do this, this is a very expensive job. And if we don't do it right, you will be buying new cabinets. So cheap insurance for me is uh, uh, testing out primers. This is, I'm lucky enough to actually have a piece of trim from this house. They're doing some remodeling. So this is best case scenario. I have a piece of the same wood, of the same finish that I will be doing here. And I followed that same prep process in my shop this morning of uh, sanding, tack ragging, vacuuming, and then a, 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 an alcohol wipe down as well. And then uh, I applied uh, three different primers. Uh, and my favorite, obviously, uh, let's see, we have oil, we have water, and then we have a hybrid, which is an oil-water mix. My favorite always is oil, and I will use this till they uh, pry it from my cold, dead hands. Uh, water base, obviously, is the easiest to use, easiest washable, no smell, but uh, sometimes it doesn't stick as well. And then hybrid is the new technology where they take an oil molecule, uh, immerse it uh, in an emulsion with water, so that when you apply it to here, the water is the vehicle, and when the water evaporates, you're left with, uh, theoretically, an oil molecule, an oil finish. So, same prep process, and as you can see here, using the scratch test, every one of these primers stuck to this perfectly. So, this is basically belt, suspenders, belt, suspenders, belt, suspenders, but uh, this may be overkill, especially after I tell you guys that I do oil primer. Um, in the future, uh, there also, th right now, there are countries and there are states very near to us that you cannot get oil products. And if you can get them, they only come in quarts. For this particular job, I'll use four to five gallons of oil primer. So when I can't get oil anymore, 
I would have been testing these water products and hybrid products for years and years and years, and I would feel confident with them so that the first time I have to use water-based primer on a house, uh, it's not going to be an experiment. I'm not going to be up late at night thinking whether it's going to stick to these. So this is cheap insurance. And uh, uh, one of my favorite things to do. It's a pain to have to get done, especially when you have a whole bunch of other stuff to do. But uh, like I said, cheap insurance when you have a project like this. So um, if you guys have any other questions as far as the uh, cabinet process goes, uh, you let me know. Uh, basically from, from here, uh, you know, after the primer gets applied, I sand the primer smooth, uh, shop back, tack rag it off, and then you apply your two top coats. Uh, obviously following the technical data sheets and uh, allowing for proper drying time sanding between coats. So. Um, the other, uh, other interesting uh, Facebook interaction I had this week was uh, uh, Kevin Kelmo. Uh, he's another painting professional, and he was wondering, he has a whole bunch of these uh, decorative brackets or corbels that a customer dropped off to him. A uh, customer wants to finish them, but they needed them stripped by a professional. And he was doing some experimenting in the shop, and I saw the, uh, I saw the comments and the threads underneath, and I could see that uh, people were coming up with sort of these very elaborate Rube Goldberg-esque sort of uh, things to... Uh, try to help him out with this and really it, it what it amounts is to a ton of time a ton of uh, uh, Money and a ton of materials to get these things stripped What I do in my shop is I take the old methyl ethyl chloride stripper uh, the very noxious very You know skull and crossbones in a tin can hidden under the back shelf of the hardware store the good stuff And I use that I just apply it with a with a hog bristle brush and then I just wrap them in plastic or put them in gallon Ziploc bags or you know put a trash bag around them 15 minutes later, you unwrap it, and it's just perfect. All the stuff comes off easy, a couple toothbrushes, a couple putty knives. Uh, you do a final rinse with a mineral spirits and a, uh, and a piece of uh, steel wool uh, or, a, or a Brillo pad, and, and they come out perfectly. Uh, and, and this works very well because you're keeping that stripper wet. When, when a stripper, when you're applying a paste stripper over to like a top of a cabinet door, and you leave it out, instantly it skins over. And it skins over to keep the underside wet, but it's, uh, it's a chemical, uh, it's a very caustic chemical, and it's gonna evaporate quickly. So, very quickly, uh, that cabinet door will dry, and as soon as that stripper dries, it loses its, uh, its potency. So, I wrap it in plastic to do that. And again, assembly line in the shop, I'll get a whole bunch of these working at different phases, so I can you know apply some, uh, cover some, while I'm stripping one, uh, you know, the other one's cooking over here and, uh, and that. So uh, he posted some pictures, said it's going well so far, and I hope that he'll, uh, he'll tell us how the whole, uh, the whole thing went. Uh, people were coming up with sort of elaborate uh, drip, uh, dip tanks and things like that. and It's good, but when you have 50 or 20 or 100 of these things to do, you really got to have a mind. If you're doing one, not a big deal. It, it, but when you're doing it for money, for somebody who expects a certain thing, you have to do it quick and you have to do it perfect. So uh, that was my, my uh, thing. I just thought it was a very interesting project. And uh, I know from uh, many, many uh, years of experimenting in my shop, I thought I would at least chime in and, and uh, he actually used the suggestion. So thank you for that. And Kevin, uh, if you're watching now or if you're watching later, let us know how the whole project went. And, uh, and uh, if the homeowner is kind enough to give you some pictures of them finished, I would like to see that too, because they kind of were a very interesting historic piece of stuff there. So. Uh, let's see, I went over the cabinet hinges, I went over the patches, I went over the primer sample. I think I'll go through some questions now, if you guys have any. Let's see here. Keep going here. Oh, Tim. Yeah, Tim's a local. Tim used to be an apprentice of mine. Uh, he... Uh, he went off to the army to be a paratrooper because he needed a break from painting, and uh, now he's a local realtor, and uh, it's good to see him and his wife doing well here. But thanks for thanks for sharing the live feed, Tim. Oh, let's see. Oh, Curtis, Curtis and Chris, John Anderson. Um, the yellow farmhouse uh, that I did this spring, uh, I actually just turned in for a PDCA uh, top job award, and hopefully I will be considered for that based on that. But John Anderson, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, uh, somebody who's watching the live feed right now, he was, he was the carpenter on that who worked his magic on this old house. And he's another young, super progressive uh, craftsman. And uh, the way he treated that old house uh, really, really impressed me. So John, kudos to you. And uh, yeah, if you got any uh, specific questions, hopefully we can team up again soon. That was about one of the funnest projects I've ever done. All right. Oh, Sheila, Sheila, thanks for watching. Thanks for sharing the live feed. Uh, Derek Anslem, 
uh, about to ask that exact question. Going to be uh, tackling a similar project early next year. Appreciate the uh, experience advice. Oh, no problem. And uh, you know what, Derek? If you have uh, any more specific questions, uh, something maybe unique to your project too, just let us know, and I'd be happy to happy to answer those for you. Juanita, thanks for the thanks for the compliment. Christian Militello, my good friend, um, do you use Festool? And if you do, uh, what do you feel the difference is between the box store sanders and Festool? If you do not, why not? Um, I have many thoughts on this, and especially in the last week or two, uh, I started really thinking about my gear, and uh, uh, I got some perspective. I joined the PDCA, the Painting and Decorating Contractors of America, maybe a year or two ago. And uh, obviously, at first, I am not a fan of trade groups. I, I, I normally think there's uh, business consultants and, and people to sell you things circling around like hawks waiting to uh, uh, prey upon you. But I was pleasantly surprised that uh, there is that in the PDCA, but there's a really, really good group of professionals who really care about the trade. And the benefit I got from that was sort of, I got perspective. Um, the tips, the tricks, the specific things that guys use, the good ones all come to the same conclusions about prep processes and tools, and maybe there's a tweak here and there, but really all the good guys do basically things the same way. But I got perspective. I, it kind of showed me where I stand in the industry. And is what I'm doing insane? Is 40 hours of prep too much? Is it too little? Should I be doing more? Uh, should I be doing less estimates? Should I be hiring more people? Should I be firing? You know, it gave me this great perspective. And one of the things that I've really been thinking about is tools. Uh, I did a presentation for the PDCA where I broke down one of my trucks. I opened up all my boxes and showed people. Um, since then, I've been looking at a lot of uh, other guys' rigs, uh, professionals' rigs, and there seems to be a lot of tools, and there seems to be a lot of stuff. Um, and it, there seems to be, especially on the online forum, and I know it's a, it's a self-selecting group when you get in these uh, Facebook or Instagram painter groups, um, but there seems to be tool fetishization. Uh, it seems that the, a lot of contractors have this tool fetish where they got to have lots of stuff and they got to have sophisticated stuff, uh, just all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I've had the same DeWalt drill for 12 years. Works fine. Uh, I added a new one to my personal collection at home, so now I have a new battery if I need one. Um, I had <laughs> my favorite screwdriver, flathead screwdriver, for taking off um, switch plates. I've had that for 10 years and then one of my apprentices was nice enough to toss it into a bush or something. Um, and you'll find that pros when you work with a lot of apprentices. Even the good ones will, <coughs> excuse me, lose tools once in a while. But I've realized that I do not fetishize tools. Um, I buy uh, one DeWalt or Craftsman a random orbital sander or mouse sander per year. I have a fleet of maybe four or five, especially when we go outside we burn through a lot of them. And I basically throw one out a year or fix it if I can and add one more to that fleet. Now, Festool, they are very high quality tools. I've seen them on the market forever. I have no doubt they're very good. But when I can get my DeWalt sander for $49 and it lasts five years, uh, and then I have a rotating stock of those, and uh, Festool is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, uh, and I would need five of them. Uh, it becomes a sort of undoable, you know, I, I don't like to carry around that much stuff. I like to keep a light footprint. I consider me and my apprentices sort of a special forces team when a lot of other guys sort of uh, fashion themselves after a standing army that has lots of overhead and lots of stuff. I like to have a small amount of highly specific tools that we use uh, and use often. And uh, even uh, my, my forays, some of my forays into some of the very, very nice tools I find that uh, uh, I'm either too cautious with them or we use them at such a high, uh, at such a high rate. Uh, we use them so much around here that they tend to wear out anyway or they're made to wear out in certain ways where you can replace parts but the replacement parts are as much as new ones and, and DeWalt's are very, very good. Uh, Makita's are very, very good. Craftsmen are very, very good. I'm not buying cheap stuff. I'm not buying, you know, tool shop from Menards that, uh, uh, that, that break on your first time using them, but I have not used Festool. However, I'm very impressed by them. Uh, that does not mean that I won't maybe buy one for my woodworking and furniture shop, but that's a hobby, and I know that I would have that the rest of my life. But when I have apprentices up on a 40-foot ladder sanding the side of a barn and they drop a sander, I don't want it to be a Festool. I want it to be a DeWalt or a Makita or, a, or something like that. So, uh, Christian, uh, a lot of guys 
they talk about certain uh, pressure washers, they talk about certain paint sprayers, they talk about sanders, they talk about all this sort of stuff. It's good. Um, and if I want to cut a, a, a limb from a tree in my yard, I'm going to get my rusty bandsaw and it will work with a little bit of effort. Now, I could get a handmade Japanese saw uh, that was, you know, fine-tuned by a guy in the mountains, but it's still only going to take me a minute to cut down that tree branch. And at, at some point, if you love Festool, if you love handmade Japanese saws, if you love all this expensive stuff, great. I'm sure it'll last you a long time. But at the production rate that me and my guys use it and, and what we demand out of these, we burn a lot of tools. And, and, you know, not to say that we go through them quick. Like I said, I can get four or five years out of a DeWalt uh, or a Craftsman or a Makita random orbital sander. I mean, the first, when I worked on my own, my first couple of years of business, I had a Makita random orbital sander that I had used five years previous personally in my wood shop. I used for about five or six years in my business. And finally, uh, the thing just stopped working. So... Um, you know, I, I don't fetishize tools. Uh, I appreciate those who want fine things because Lord knows I do that sometimes too, but uh, my painting business is not one of them. I buy very good tools and I expect a lot out of them and I'm, and I'm usually impressed how long and how well uh, they do their job. So I hope that, uh, hope that helps you. Oh, and I should say Christian too. Um, I have this standing edict that um, this goes for my personal life and my professional life that if the, if the solution to every problem is money or buying something, it's usually the wrong decision. Uh, if uh, most problems can be solved with effort or knowledge or experience, if they can't, then supplement with buying something. But I always try the effort part first. Or if you have to buy something, be reasonable about it. I mean, we're, we're in a very consumer culture and there's very sexy, flashy, interesting things out there. I've never been disappointed by a Craftsman $42 random orbital sander, to tell you the truth. I sanded all these cabinet doors in my shop with them. And, you know, unless you buy the fancy sandpapers and all this other stuff, again, I've never really been impressed by all the name brand stuff. I buy the random orbital packs like this of the Gator from my Ace Hardware, uh, of, the, of the sanding pads like that. They're awesome, and they work really well, and uh, seems economical. So, um... Now, I guess that's my reason for, uh, you know, again, I've watched this old house, I've watched New Yankee Workshop, so I've, I've seen Festool around since I was a little kid, and I'm very impressed by them. But for me, you know, I'll, I'll just use stuff that's, uh, you know, sort of run-of-the-mill, I guess. My, my opinion, though. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Okay. Oh, Tank. Tank, <laughs> Tank Ayers is an old army friend of mine. Hope it's going well, man. Good to see you. Oh, Micah. Micah. Micah Gilbertson's another apprentice of mine. Uh, I was very impressed with him. And again, he wanted a break from painting, so he's now a military policeman in the Marine Corps. So I hope you're enjoying your vacation. Um, Justin, I use Extreme Bond Primer from Sherwin-Williams for cabinets. Um, people have a very specific taste in, in, in these primers. Now, uh, there's Insulex, there's Sticks, there's uh, Bonds, there's Extreme Bond Primer. Uh, I am fairly confident that most of these will do, you know, what it needs to be done here. Uh, the reason, um, when I cannot get oil anymore, that will probably be one of the primers in my cadre of sort of primers. But I have not seen a water-based primer, even if it sticks. Like, even when you take a look at my oil-water hybrid, um, even if they all stick the same, this oil is going to sand better than both of these. Now, the hybrid is a, is a close second. Um, it sands very easily. And, and sandability is just as important to me as sticking because how smooth your finish is is all based on how smooth you can sand or buff your primer coat. And I spent a lot of time in there smoothing out the primer coat so that when you apply your top coat, you know, you're, that's the easy part. The, the top coat is 10% of a project like this. It's all prep. It's all priming. So... Um, when I cannot get the oil anymore, uh, I have used that product before, uh, fairly pleased with it, uh, but it, uh, I have not found any of those water-based primers yet to be as sandable as an oil. And if somebody has one, definitely. I mean, if it's on par with a cover stain or a traditional oil primer from Sherwin or Benjamin Moore or things like that, please let me know because uh, I will start experimenting now for when the day comes that, uh, that I can't get oil anymore. So, now, Danny, good to see you, man. Larry Tunessi, try out using uh, with a crock pot and water, but I love methyl ethyl ketone. 
Uh, Larry, this particular Corbell was not metal. It was, uh, it was a wood bracket. Uh, and so, yeah, if you would have uh, dropped that sucker in a crock pot, that thing would have been soup. So uh, very interesting point, though, that you, uh, that you put there. <clears throat> I have a crock pot in my shop dedicated to stripping old hardware. So if you have old painted over hinges, doorknobs, things like this, do not take stripper to them. You're going to ruin the patina on them. You dip them in a crock pot, and an hour later, you just wipe the paint off with your hands, and you can keep the original patina on there. Um, you don't need to do that. You could take an old hinge, and you could just scrape and sand and whatever, but you're going to change the look of the metal. And as a preservationist and a restorationist, I prefer that old patina. When I strip old wood floors, I try to keep that 100 years of patina on them and not sand them down to new stuff. Same thing with the hardware. I love that, that, that unlacquered brass where it's just it gets nice and gold and dark and deep. And if you, if you take chemicals or sanding pads to it, you're going to lose all that. So it's a good tip, though, Larry, uh, uh, for metal stuff but not wood. All right, let's see if there's any... Oh, Justin, yeah, thanks for chiming in, man. Okay, I think that's it for this week's live feed, guys. Thank you so much for this. Uh, there's a button there to follow this, so every time I go live, you can get an update. Share the link if you like it, and uh, give me any questions you guys have. You can Facebook message me, or you can just post them on Facebook and hashtag them, Ask a Painter. Um, and Todd, oh, I should mention, Todd and uh, Tamara, uh, I will be sending you guys some of my handmade mugs uh, yeah, for using your questions in this. So thank you guys so much, and uh, have a good weekend.